Good afternoon, Eastern Washington. This is Matt Shea, and welcome to Patriot Radio, broadcasting live from the capital of free Washington. Hopefully someday, maybe the capital of liberty, Spokane Valley. Brought to you once again by the committee to elect Matt Shea, Republican, in the legacy of Dr. Stan Monteith, bringing you the story behind the story and the news behind the news. And it's not about right or left, it's about right or wrong. And are we going to do the hard work to implement freedom because our hope is not in man but in Jesus Christ? And we can't end in prayer, we must also move to action. We must become the warriors the Lord has called us to be. Exodus 15.3 says the Lord is a warrior, the Lord is his name, are we warriors? That's the question. Are we going to become, are we going to become those warriors? These words should bring up in everyone's minds military warfare. But this is in the spiritual realm, but it should bring up military warfare as a perspective, as a lens. So there are some things, you know, when you talk about the spiritual realm and you talk about fighting in the spiritual realm, there are three things that are basic rules of war. Now, you can expand these, but before we get to those three things, there's something that everyone needs to understand, and that idea is that we must humble ourselves and know what we don't know. In other words, admit that we don't know what we don't know. And if we can do that, then we can move on to the three basic rules of war. Know your enemy, know yourself. And know the terrain or the signs of the times. Know your enemy. Know yourself. Know the signs of the times. And I want to start with the know your enemy side because still I run into people. Although the perception is changing and people are starting to wake up because of what they're seeing, there is a physical manifestation of the war going on in the spiritual realm. We see it in the streets of America today. You saw it here a few days ago in Berkeley. People getting literally cornered and beat up by leftist activists. And people think, well, they're just just out of control, young people. And No. This is in, you've got to know your enemy. They have planned, they have plotted, they have strategized, they have trained, they have organized. And they are working their plan. This is all part of an intentional plan to bring down America. It's all part of an intentional plan to get rid of the Constitution. It's all part of an intentional plan to demonize conservatives, Christians, libertarians, people that love freedom everywhere, And to create so much chaos that they can then write in and say, well, we need more government, not less. This is a strategy that has been worked in communist circles for a century. A lot of people don't know that Lenin, and especially his older brother, worked for 30 years prior to 1917. In fact, Lenin wasn't even in Russia at the time. He was actually in Switzerland when everything started to happen in St. Petersburg and actually had to go through Germany which was at war at the time it was World War I and many I think rightly claim that Lenin was a subversive agent the Germans thought he was a subversive agent because they were going to split Russia and take that front away from the Germans and so he goes back to Russia And he may not have been a paid agent of Germany, but he certainly worked toward Germany's ends by making Russia so chaotic that it took him off that front of the war. So, understand that this intentional fomenting of chaos is done for a reason. It's done according to a plan. It's done specifically to accomplish certain goals. And if we understand our enemy, 
we can begin to fight. And I'm going to talk about next show about understanding ourselves, and then I'll talk about the signs of the times as well. But it's important to understand this, and it's also important to understand that we need to be intentional. We need to plan. We need to organize. And that's not organize for violence or something like that. That's organize for self-defense. That is organize in the political sphere to turn things back toward the Constitution. That's organize prayer and deal with these things in the spiritual realm. It's not, you know, people will, will try to say, oh, you can't, you know, meet their violence. That's not what we're saying. It's not what I'm saying. What I'm saying is we need to be intentional in our planning and our organization and our training to preserve freedom and liberty. And part of that plan is Liberty State. Is recognizing that there are completely two divergent worldviews in Washington State. We already are separate in our worldviews. And that this new flag that has been voted on should be flying everywhere that people love liberty and freedom. All throughout eastern Washington and beyond. And we're going to be getting that up on the store online soon. We're finishing the, the logistics of making all this happen, but it should be within the next two weeks. But we have to be intentional in our plan, too. That's the point. And if we don't understand that, then we will lose. If we don't understand we need to be intentional in our planning and our training and our organization for preserving freedom and liberty, we will lose. It's just as simple as that. It's an old maxim of warfare. Political warfare, spiritual warfare, same principles. Which brings us now to your daily intelligence briefing on the international front. In the Middle East, once again, Kurdish independence vote in northern Iraq going to occur on September 25th. Also, North Korea launching... Now, this is kind of funny, because I presume that there won't be an apology from Sean Vestal. But North Korea launching a missile over Japan. And, by the way, it would need to be a similar flight path to head toward the United States or Guam. The Japanese are furious, and rightfully so. And there is still more saber-rattling. Apparently some dummy bombs were dropped near the demilitarized zone between North Korea and South Korea today. Japanese aircraft, South Korean aircraft, and U.S. aircraft participating, according to the reports that I got. And... Some people are trying to poo- continue to poo-poo it. I want to spell this out for you, what is happening. Many experts believe that China uses North Korea as its surrogate to test other countries and the resolve of other countries. And that when we got so close to that launch happening here a couple weeks ago, that that was a test of U.S. resolve so they would know how the United States would act in economic negotiations. If they know that they wouldn't blink in that scenario, then they obviously wouldn't blink in economic negotiations. And that's what China, many people believe, was doing in, in allowing to happen through North Korea to test the United States. Which begs the question, if they've flown one over Japan, were they testing Japan's resolve? And will this continue? I mean, you can't really test resolve unless you're prepared to call the bluff of whoever you're testing. And it's important to understand that geostrategic reason for some of these things happening, and I don't think people understand that. Now, China has also said they would not let chaos or a war happen on their doorstep here just recently. And so then it, again, is, are they just using these things to test resolve. And it's probably, yes, there's probably going to be more of these situations occurring, and it's important for everybody to understand it and filter through that lens. That does not make the fact 
that the North Koreans were that close to a launch toward Guam any less real. But the question is, will they try to do it again? And that is where people that don't have any experience serving in the military, who have no experience overseas, who are not well read, will come up and say, oh, it's just not a threat. No, you just don't understand. That's where that comes from. It's, it's born of ignorance. And the fact of the matter is there are a lot of people that are connected now via the Internet and other mode, modes of uh, communication that share information around this country. A lot of great patriots. A lot of former military. And uh, it's a great information sharing network. And the fact of the matter is, we are going to see newspapers, we're going to see online liberal publications be very jealous of that fact because they don't have the information to share because they're just not as connected. They just aren't. And you know something, that decentralization is actually a good thing. And... You know, newsprint media is just on its way out. It's on its dying breath. It dies with the baby boom generation, and they all know it. They all know it. So I'm going to continue to share information with you as I get it when I have verified and corroborated it, especially when it's so exigent. And that brings us next to this suspected attack on the embassy personnel in Cuba, more information coming out. Apparently more people than were originally thought were injured and are being treated. Now this has really been kept quiet, uh, but they believe it was some sort of a sonic weapon, and that's what's being reported by Free Beak. So we're going to keep our eyes on that as that continues to go. Venezuelan civil unrest has gone eerily quiet. Now, Maduro is is strengthening his dictatorship down there but things have gone eerily quiet i suspect that this is the preparation for a for a full-on civil war that they've gone quiet to organize they've gone quiet to consolidate and that we're going to probably see something here in a little while also on the international front in the united kingdom a very disturbing story i it, it's shocking, actually, that this would even be happening or considered, but it's un- unbelievable, actually, that there was a Christian child whose five-year-old girl who was forced to live with fundamentalist Muslim family. Even though her grandparents were ready to take her in. And even though her parents begged this particular UK authority to allow her to stay with her grandparents, they took her away and put her with a hardline fundamentalist Muslim family. And one of the quotes that came out of this case was alarming. But it just shows kind of the contempt for just people and just decency. And this is... This is unbelievable from another perspective, too, before I get to that. She speaks English, this five-year-old girl, and she's put into a home where they don't. And yet they still did it. They still did it. And the other part of this that's interesting, too, is that it was kind of implied, well, then you better start speaking Arabic. I want you to understand what that means. If that ever comes to the United States, 
I mean, is that what our system is is going to happen with our system? Are they going to actually use the system to start taking children away and putting them into homes where they can languish and be taken away from their heritage and their culture? And the answer is probably that's already happening in some places, unfortunately, in America. And here... It's this disturbing tale out of Britain um, that just goes against all common sense. Also on the national front, Texas, 100,000 homes destroyed or damaged. Chemical plant down there is exploding. Looks like there are now gas shortages in the Dallas-Fort Worth area uh, and more expected Uh, Please continue praying for the folks down there. I will say, though, that the response in Texas to that natural disaster has been phenomenal outside of the fact that the Houston mayor didn't tell people to evacuate. But uh, this is is on the scale of Katrina and uh, is going to be with us for a very long time. But some of the things you can look at through this are... What happens when a hurricane, what happens when a natural disaster has such dramatic effect? What are the the secondary and tertiary effects? And when does food run out? When does fuel run out? And we're starting to see some of those things. And I think it's a good call, wake-up call for a lot of us that we we just need to be prepared. And not just because the gas prices are raising 10 cents or something. We need to be prepared if there is that sort of an emergency. How can we help other people? There uh, There were people down there. They went out and they were heroes, and there were people down there who went down there or were from there and took advantage of the situation, tried to rob and loot. And we need to be ready for this kind of stuff because it can hit at any time. I'm sure Houston, Texas last month didn't think that would ever happen, or for that matter, any of the other folks in Texas. Also on the national front, the Southern Poverty Law Center, and this is in the, it's about Time Department, the Southern Poverty Law Center has been sued for defamation. It was brought up that the Southern Poverty Law Center, with its hate map, is just arbitrarily labeling Christian groups as hate groups. And so some folks finally got fed up and said, nope, we're not taking it anymore. We're not going to listen to this anymore. And now the Southern Poverty Law Center is facing a lawsuit. In addition, the Southern Poverty Law Center has been receiving millions from Apple and J.P. Morgan Chase and apparently has moved at least over $2 million overseas. And literally outside the country, and I shouldn't say overseas, but outside the country to the Caymans over A.C., but outside this country, offshore. And that's bringing up a lot of different questions of why they were doing that. And interestingly enough, all of these corporate folks that are running the Southern Poverty Law Center, their top management are making lucrative six-figure salaries. Apparently it's not about poverty or law. (laughs) Unbelievable. So keep your eyes on that. That's going to continue to, to uh, I think manifest, and I think the Southern Poverty Law Center is on its way down. Also on the national front, after a 49-page page manual was leaked in regards to the takedown of Donald Trump, and then an 8-page manual was found at Evergreen State College. Now, there have been a lot of different things on the Internet, and all that's not true. And I looked into this, talked to... Talked to a few folks, and apparently it was indeed found on Evergreen State College campus. But the point of this is getting back to the intentionality of those that want to see America go away. Antifa has a lot to do with these manuals and has a lot to do with this planning and a lot of these things... The, you know, the, the, one of these factions published this guerrilla warfare manual. But here is something I think that was more telling. A lot more telling, actually. 
There was, I think, 30 arrests. But 10 of these mugshots in Berkeley, and it happened on Tuesday. And some of these rallies, you know, they saw 4,000 agitators. Anyway, the bottom line is, World Net Daily is reporting about these 10 Antifa mugshots. And here's the key. Here's the point you need to learn about this. That the average age of these 10, actually 13 people that were arrested at Sunday's violent political riots in Berkeley. Okay? The average age of these people was 30 years old. What does that tell you? Well, it tells us a couple things. First, they were not students. Second, these were professional agitators sent in to rile up the students and oversee this. That implies a vast amount of planning and confirms what we've been saying for a long time, that these are professional agitators, not college students. Also on the national front... This judge fired for being a Christian. I want to read something. You know, there were some people on on Facebook that were saying, oh, you know, they just need to do their job, etc. But here's the, the bottom line. The Wyoming State Constitution is very clear on this issue of this judge being fired. And I want to read this. And this is Article 1, Section 18 of the Wyoming State Constitution. The free exercise and enjoyment of religious profession... And worship. Now, profession means the professing, okay? And worship. Without discrimination or preference shall be forever guaranteed in this state. And no person shall be rendered incompetent to hold any office of trust or profit because of his opinion on any matter of religious belief, whatever. So you have another very strongly worded protection of religious liberty in the Wyoming State Constitution, and this judge is still fighting for the job, even though the Constitution is crystal clear. All right, also on the regional front, Evergreen State College, many of you are probably going to have a smile on your face for that, for this article. But this is coming from the collegefix.com. Evergreen State College faces $2.1 million budget shortfall, citing an enrollment drop, many of whom are relating to the antics that they did late last year, or late this year, actually, late last spring. And this $2.1 million budget shortfall um, means that they're going to have to start laying off teachers and other folks from Evergreen State College. Looks like they're reaping what they sowed. Also on the regional front, Bundy Ranch trial. After the not guilty verdicts on 34 of 40 charges in a hung jury on six of those remaining charges, they're going to try him for a third time on the six charges. Three times. Even more probably upsetting, at least to me, is that the guy in charge of the entire operation, Dan Love. Now, Dan Love was with the BLM. He's kind of become notorious for his role in the Bundy Ranch standoff. But it's really a protest. But the bottom line is, He oversaw the cattle seizure. He oversaw this whole operation. And he's been accused by federal investigators of stealing and withholding evidence. So the head of the the Bundy Ranch situation for the BLM gets accused by federal investigators of stealing and withholding evidence. And they try to call it evidence mishandling, but there's very clear, according to their investigation, very clear reason to charge Dan Love. With a matter of integrity, I mean, if you're in a law enforcement position like that, it's a matter of integrity. And yet Dan Love is not going to be prosecuted, but these guys for the third time are going to be prosecuted for six charges. The jury is hung on twice already. 
That's outrageous. And one of the great reasons, I, you know, I, one of the great reasons I think to see this entire situation in terms of the little guy versus government overreach is when you got a guy caught dead to rights on an integrity issue in a law enforcement position and they don't prosecute. Does anybody have any faith left in that institution? The answer is no. The leaders should should have seen that and said, "Wait, we want to make sure we restore faith." We restore integrity, and they should have prosecuted. And apparently, Dan Love is above the law. Also on the regional front, Department of Interior is still taking comments on all regulations regarding BLM, Park Service, etc. Weigh in. You have an opportunity to weigh in, weigh in. And my guest is going to be talking a little bit about these things today. Also on the local front, Spokane Valley City Council looking into the vaccination issue and going to continue looking into the vaccination issue. Also moving forward on some of the transportation projects in Spokane Valley, and particularly Barker Road. Looks like there's almost enough money to complete that project again without raising taxes. Also on the local front, Rob Chase, the number one pick by the precinct committee officers for county commissioner, the guy that has won twice countywide, beat the number two PCO pick two to one head to head. In a race here a couple of years ago, still has not been picked by the county commissioners. And apparently the holdup is Al French. So if you want to weigh in, you can email Al French at afrench at spokanecounty.org. And apparently he does not want to go with the sitting county treasurer the guy who already has established relationships with the state legislature, the guy who has been uh, the most successful county treasurer as far as passing legislation in this area, the guy who has, again, beat the number two pick two to one, and that's not taking away anything, that's just the facts, he's obviously the most electable, still does not want to choose Mr. Chase. And so if he doesn't, then it's going to go to the governor, Jay Inslee, to choose. And also on the local front, sexual assault allegations rocking the Democrat Party. Now, there's two of them. I want to go through this very quickly. Um, The first... Very disturbing, but uh, the state Democrat Party has been investigated for this. Apparently there was um, some sort of a, a gathering that they had. And a longtime progressive activist was actually removed from a position earlier this year. But this happened apparently at a Democrat Party meeting in Walla Walla and involved underage alcohol. There were, apparently this was a party. And apparently there was an underage girl that suffered a sexual assault. Now, the Spokesman Review reported on this. Haven't heard a lot more from anybody about this. But uh, there is some investigation going on. And again, rocking the Democrat Party statewide. And on the heels of that, a Washington State University student who held several leadership positions in student organizations, including the Young Democrats, was arrested in a sting operation targeting sexual predators earlier this year. So you've got some investigations happening, and the Democrat Party is having a real hard time, it looks like. There is um, also all these other investigations going on in regards to the PDC violations, and also in regards to misappropriation of funds in the Democrat Party here in Spokane County and the allegation of 208 counts of forgery. Goodness. 
I think, you know, this kind of highlights that while that's happening to the Democrats, we have to have our own house in order as conservatives as well. And we can't just... We just can't think that this is, you know, only a one-off, only they do this kind of stuff. This stuff happens sometimes, and we need to be upfront about it all the way across the board. And I'm really glad to see the Democrat Party being held accountable in such a way as to almost shut down the Attorney General's office right now. There have been so many investigations. So I've just been uh, given word that our guest today, Harriet Hagman, is an attorney. Um, that the phone line is out, apparently where either she's at or um, on the South Hill. But I'm going to continue talking about some land use issues today. I want to talk a little bit about not just the Hearst decision. I want to talk a little bit about what we can all be doing to get involved at the community level on land use decisions. I want to talk a little bit today about Green Bluff, actually among several others. But let's talk first about the Hearst decision. And for those of you that don't know the Hearst decision, it's good to understand that coming across the plains when the West was settled, people brought their animals, they brought their families, brought large wagon trains, and they would come up and find some water. And sometimes they would just stop there. Once they found water, they would just stop, and that's where they would settle. And it makes sense, because you don't want to sit there and, you know, try to guess that water is going to be, you know, maybe the next 10 miles or the next 20 miles. You find water, it's a precious resource, you're going to stay there. And so as a result of that came the idea of first in time, first in right. The first person that found it, settled there, they were first in time, they were first in that water right. Now, there was always a presumption that any time that you use that water, that you were not impacting someone else. Now, that could you could be upstream. It could be a well. But if you were first in time, first in right, there was a presumption you weren't impacting. Now, later, a presumption was recognized that if you punched any well, even if you weren't first in time, but later you, you, you just punched a well that used 5,000 gallons a day or less, that you were not impacting surface water and you weren't impacting groundwater of anybody around you. And it was the burden of proof on the person that believed they were being impacted to show it. Now, sometimes that can be done. It can be done with well logs. It can be done with, um, you know, uh, flow tests, all kinds of different ways. But the fact of the matter is there was this presumption. Then comes... The Washington State Supreme Court, who overturns all of that water law, 100 plus years of water law, and says, no, wait, now there is a presumption that you are impacting everyone around you when you drill a well. Well, that turns water law on its head because now every person, when they put a well in, needs to do a massive study to make sure they're not impacting all the water around them. And to do that costs about $200,000. To do that, you have to study the basin where all that water is. Well, that effectively makes it so nobody can put a well in. And that's what's been happening with this Hearst decision. The, The problem is if we don't solve this that you will see property values begin to tank because they can't put a well on their property. And as a result, property taxes and revenue from that will go down, affecting education and all the way across the board. But yet the Democrats want this. They're insistent that there must be this presumption. Why? Because if you control water, you control people. If you can control Who puts a well in? You can control people. You can control development. You can control the economy. I hope that's starting to make sense to everybody now. Now, there are some counties that are fighting this and saying, hey, look, we're not even part of the growth management act, so this doesn't apply to us. And I think they have a very valid argument. 
But there are other counties that are part of the Growth Management Act that are having a serious issue. Which brings up the corollary issue to Hearst. And that is growth outside of the urban growth boundary or the urban growth area. Now, the Growth Management Act was an attempt to literally draw a line around a city and say that beyond that line, development couldn't happen in the same way. Inside that line basically was a stack em and pack em idea that you could build up, and that's what people needed to do inside that urban growth area. Well, the problem was that when they drew these lines, that many times land owned by school districts was outside of that urban growth area. And so now you couldn't extend utilities, particularly sewer, out to these properties, these places to build schools. And so essentially the land was useless, even though we need actually more schools, especially since everybody wants to get to the 17 to 1 student to teacher ratio. So all of a sudden you have all this land, you can't use it because of these urban growth areas. So we attempted actually this session to change that with a school siting bill introduced by my good friend Bob McCaslin Jr. and say, okay, look, you can extend the utilities out to that school. And all along that, those utilities can connect into other things as well. And again, we're pre- predominantly talking about sewer, at least in our area. So you have places like uh, out here in Green Acres, uh, right near the boundary in Green Acres. Um, you have a school that's going to go in, but it's just outside of that urban growth area. You've got churches as well who can't take advantage of the sewer going into an area even though they should, and instead of being on septic. And so you have environmental policies actually making things worse, making things worse for the environment because of these arbitrary lines that are being drawn. The Central Valley School District has a bunch of property outside of the urban growth area, and they cannot build new schools because of this. Now, we would have solved this with this bill, but what happened was Inslee vetoed that section of the bill. He kept the section for the west side of the state, it applied to a school district, I think, near Bothell, but he did not keep it for the east side of the state. And so, all of a sudden, again, we have the West being treated different than the East. And these exceptions being made to these radical environmental policies. Only where it's convenient on the West side. Just infuriating, kind of. And so that's, a, that's part of the issue that we see now is this urban-rural divide and the fact that some things just don't make sense and they're not going to fit in some neat little paradigm. And, and I don't believe in the Growth Management Act. It should be repealed. It's been a horrible failure. It's not done what it was ostensibly put into law to do. And local communities can take care of this stuff. Why why shouldn't a local community be able to extend their sewer system another 250 feet instead of having a gigantic church build a septic field? This doesn't make sense. When everybody's in agreement that that's exactly what should happen. You know, I mean, it just doesn't make sense. Shouldn't communities build schools when they need to build schools? And and those schools, shouldn't they be closer to neighborhoods so kids can walk to school or ride bikes to school? Instead of being bussed in, which, by the way, bussing kids in is very, very expensive. So this doesn't even save money. Why why shouldn't local communities be able to make that decision? I think they should. And I think that's what we need to get out there is this local communities will make right decisions if you're allowing them the flexibility to do so. And these one-size-fits-all things that might be great for downtown Seattle are just not good for Spokane Valley, Washington. And that brings us next to the issue of Green Bluff. You have 
an interesting, and this happens in these areas that are really kind of close to cities. In Washington state law, there's a small track ag statute. And in that statute, there was a promotion of small agriculture. What is that? Well, that is small, you know, wheat fields or hay fields, sometimes hops, berries, orchards, vineyards. And the promotion was to keep farms small, like they used to be 100 years ago. All the farms were, were, were fairly small, and everybody lived on the small farms, raised enough for themselves and their families, and were able to sell them at market. Well, this was tr- kind of trying to get back to that when they did these zoning codes. To so small track ag, the whole principle behind it was you grew on your property, and you sold on your property. And you could sell, actually, at events that you held on your property. So they allowed events to happen so that you could sell there. And so Green Bluff, under this kind of idea, has blossomed. And now there are some people that are coming against that. But it just goes to show that even when you try to do the right thing and people are growing you know, growing their own things and they're selling them at their own events and they're doing the right thing and they're abiding by the intent of the law, that still people can come against that because it's not exactly what they want. That's not what the free market is, folks. It's not what the free market is. If you're going to, you know, everybody's going to say, okay, we want a small track ag statute, then everybody's abiding by the rules except for a few people who don't like it and then they decide to go against it. That's not the free market. I mean, the fact that there is a small track ag statute, in fact, is really not the free market either. But the fact of the matter is, it is there, and there are people abiding by the rules, and it shows another way that land use is impacting not only the economy, but how people use some of this stuff as weapons against other businesses or other individuals to feather their own nest. And it's important that local government push back against those kind of things. Very important. It's also important that, and this is, a, this is kind of a paradigm change, I think, for, for some folks. It's important that bureaucrats understand that they exist, actually, to serve the people, not the other way around. That we are all innocent until proven guilty, not guilty until proven innocent, and yet especially in the land use area and especially in the business area. And I'm talking everything from electrical contractors to daycare centers. Bureaucrats have turned that on its head and say, no, you serve us. And gone out and found every nitpicky little thing they can find businesses on, find daycares on. Sometimes I think with the intent to shut people down. I mean, that's so... You can't really escape that conclusion if they continue to do things that are arbitrary and capricious. And so you have business owners and people that are saying, no, wait, we're not going to allow this to happen. We're going to fight back. We are going to fight back. No, this is not going to happen. But everybody seems to miss the fact that these land use statutes were the cause. That these statutes to regulate business were the cause that these rules to regulate business were the cause because somewhere at some time someone thought they knew better. They didn't listen to the guys on the ground. They didn't listen to the gals on the ground. They didn't take advice and counsel. They just said, no, we know better. And they use, these bureaucrats use these statutes and these rules then to create a huge problem. The solution is very simple. It's a, it's a flip back in the paradigm that, no, if you're working for the government, you work there to serve the folks. And, yes, sometimes the folks might be hard to deal with. But when I see a lot of rational, reasonable people coming forward with very reasonable concerns, they want to have reasonable solutions, and they kind of get stiff-armed, you gotta, you got to ask yourself, is this what the founders intended? And obviously it is not.
And that's where, what brings us to one of the solutions that I want to talk about today. And that is a reform of the Administrative Procedures Act. The Administrative Procedures Act lays out how state agencies can come against businesses, daycares, electrical contractors, and is supposed to be there to protect the rights of those folks. But here, here are some problems with the Administrative Procedures Act. First of all, a uh, bureaucrat uses an agency, comes after a business, finds them, business protests, fights it all the way up and wins. The business gets no attorney's fees, generally. No attorney's fees. None of that time back. But they won. So most businesses will just say, no, we're just going to pay the fine. Because it's just not worth it. That's not right. That's not right at all. I think, and we've introduced this bill, that if you're the prevailing party in one of these administrative actions, that you should get your attorney's fees. Because then there's the disincentive for the government to do stuff just because they know that businesses aren't going to take them to trial, that they're just going to blink and pay the fine. I guess one way to turn the tables back toward justice and truth. Number two, let's say you go to an administrative hearing, an administrative law judge who is paid by the same agency gets to decide whether your case has merit or not. Well, wait a minute. How is that independent? It should go before an independent judge. Period. And that's another solution to this. Third, you have some folks that will go through this administrative proceeding, they'll get a ruling against them, and then they do go to court. They actually appeal to a court. And what happens? The court gives deference to the agency decision. Well, wait a minute. Shouldn't the court see it totally new again and not with any sort of weighting toward the agency? I mean, giving government the benefit of the doubt? Wait a minute, that's not what the Founding Fathers said. They said you're supposed to have the benefit of the doubt. I'm supposed to have the benefit of the doubt. Not government. Not some government bureaucrat. So, flipping that back and saying, wait a minute, agencies don't get any deference. This should be looked at brand new. That would turn the tables back toward truth and toward justice. And those are just some examples of how the Administrative Procedures Act works, but works really against everybody that's there. And the last thing is evidentiary standard. The evidentiary standard in an administrative proceeding is extremely lax. What does that mean? That means that hearsay can come in. That means evidence that normally would be excluded is allowed in. And then, oh, by the way, that the evidence that's allowed in that would normally be excluded in a real court then is used to give that agency deference. How does that work? We're supposed to have due process. Due process is supposed to protect the individual, not the bureaucrat in government. And, And so changing it would be to require the same evidentiary standards in these administrative proceedings. Now, again, it's just trying to fix as much as you can in this system as it exists right now but it should be overhauled there should not be this administrative system weighted in favor of the agency that is ridiculous it's unconstitutional in my opinion now now judges have upheld this though but how on earth can the executive branch have both legislative power making rules and judicial power, administrative proceedings, when there's supposed to be separation of powers. How, how is that due process? It, it really isn't, ultimately. And, and we're running into the same, same situation that England did, actually, a few centuries ago, where you have swarms of officers eating out the substance of people. In fact, wasn't that in the Declaration of Independence? So we've got to turn that back to where it should be. 
And that brings me finally on, on land use and in some of the ways that you can be involved. First, if you have not ever heard of the American Policy Center, you need to go take a look at it. Tom DeWeese's organization. I've had him on the radio show before. He has an entire kit to show you how to turn the tables back in your community. Number two, need to elect good county commissioners because you have strong county commissioners with background and knowledge. They can push back on a lot of this stuff. They're not an agency of the state. They can push back on a lot of this stuff. Next, good city councils. And we have this, this race, these races in Spokane Valley that are going on right now. And if you want to see Spokane Valley turn into Spokane, you know, vote for the progressive slate that's running against the existing city council. The existing city council, by contrast, has not raised taxes, has less than 2% growth rate of government, has figured out how to fund transportation projects, including the Sullivan Bridge and the Barker, inter- Barker uh, overpass over the railroad, the grade separation, without raising taxes and cobbling it together and figuring out relationships and saving taxpayers at least $10 million on the project by having it looked at again and redesigned. Or you can have the progressives who are going to come in and think that they know better about how you should use your property, about how much more government we should have to help folks. And that's what we're talking about. If you want more bureaucrats, vote for the progressive slate that's coming against the incumbents. If you want freedom and liberty to stay in Spokane Valley to remain the capital of free Washington, then vote for Rod Higgins and Caleb Collier, Mike Munch, and Pam Haley and Ed Pace. That's that's the stark contrast, and it goes all to land use. So that's another thing you can do is get involved in these local races. Third, you can get involved in the Citizens Alliance for Property Rights. You can learn about how to fight back against some of these land use issues. Filing public records requests attending the hearings and some of these things that nobody goes to so you can have your voice heard and weigh in and change the direction of things. And then lastly, you can live freedom. Now, some people get really upset that maybe the house next door isn't as kept up as their house. You know what? That's freedom. Now, if they redirect a creek and it floods over your property, that's a different matter. But freedom isn't how you think it should look. It's the reciprocal right of saying, hey, look, I recognize your right to own that property and use it for what you need to use it for. As long as you recognize my right to do the same on my property. And where we have gone astray is thinking that it's our job to look into our neighbor's yards constantly. And maybe they haven't mowed in a while. But Matt, they're affecting my property values. Well, have you done the Christian thing and gone over to that neighbor and seen maybe if they've fell on hard times or maybe somebody's very ill and they can't be out there? You see the the difference in mentality, the difference in, in, in how you switch that. So we've got to live what we say we believe. And rural areas in the United States of America is keeping this country together. It is keeping the values that have made this nation great. And Thomas Jefferson talked about that, that the yeoman farmer would preserve the values. The heritage, the culture that has made America great. And we need to do the same. We need to live it. And we need to recognize that sometimes we're at fault too. I found myself actually doing that a couple times. Trying to judge a neighbor. You know, if you go to Ukraine, you can see a mansion right next to a shack. 
And in some respects, that is indeed what freedom looks like. And if you do, again, want to get involved, I really, really encourage you to go to American Policy Center. Also, uh, talk to local CAPER folks, Citizens Alliance for Property Rights. Uh, They can really help you out with some of this stuff. And we all have to take the time to get involved now because we may not have the time to get involved later. And especially you young folks, if you want to get involved in some of this stuff, you can actually send me a message via Facebook on Patriot Radio's Facebook page, Patriot Radio US. Or you can maybe help in another way. You can go to votesha.com. You can donate money, and and that's another way to help fight. Keep us on the radio and keep us fighting the good fight in Olympia. And I always say us and we because it's never one guy. It's always a lot of people. I have a lot of supporters that are around me. But if, if we all come together and realize with intentionality and plan with intentionality to preserve freedom and liberty, this country will continue. This state will continue. This community will continue. But that implies we've got to get involved. We've got to pray, but we have to get involved. And I want to thank every one of you for listening today. And sorry we couldn't get the guest on. We'll figure out what happened there. But uh, land use really comes down to the local level, but it comes down to me and you. Are we going to sit by or are we going to do something about it? Thank you once again for joining me on Patriot Radio today. Remember... Do everything you can to defend freedom locally. May God bless all of you, and may he make this generation the greatest one.